public transit, clean cars and manufacturing, and working with key industries to eliminate pollution. Today, we are putting forward a set of principles, not prescriptions, that will require leveraging new financing, providing new resources, and training and using existing laws and new regulations to meet our 10-year goal. We can create high-quality jobs and enforce labor standards, guarantee rights to retirement security and health care, and conduct inclusive decision-making. There will be critics who will say, this does not go far enough or that this can never get done. These, of course, are the same cynics who said auto companies would never agree to raise fuel economy standards. The same naysayers who insisted that a global climate agreement in Paris was entirely impossible. I am continually comforted by their consistency. They have been consistently wrong. And the greatest climate denier of them all is in the White House, Donald Trump, a president who did not utter the words climate change or clean energy during his State of the Union two nights ago. On the most important issue facing this country, his State of the Union, Donald Trump's State of the Union was silent. Every reason Trump and the deniers and the critics offer to give up is proof positive that we should push forward even harder. So the question isn't whether all Democrats can support this resolution. It is if any Republican will support this resolution. The question should not be if we can do it. The answer should be when we will do it. Five decades ago, President Kennedy announced the ambitious goal of sending an American safely to the moon. He didn't say how it would be done, but that we would do it. We would need a giant rocket made of new metal alloys that had not been invented yet. And it would have to be returned safely to Earth within 10 years. He urged us to be bold. I say today that it is time for us to be bold once again. We have the technology to do it. We have the moral obligation. We have the economic imperative. We just need the political will to get this done. The sun is setting on the dirty energy of the past. Today marks the dawn of a new era of climate action. When we look back today, this will be the moment that we will be able to say that the political tide has turned on the rising seas. We are reclaiming our leadership on the most important issue facing humankind. This is the new climate democracy of the people, by the people, for the planet. I thank you all for being here today on this historic day. And now, now I want to introduce to you my phenomenal partner on this resolution, the great Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Senator, and uh, thank you to all of my colleagues here that have joined us today. This is so incredible. This is such a major watershed moment, and I am so incredibly excited that we are going to transition this country into the future, and we are not going to be dragged behind by our past. I'm so excited by that. I think that today is not just a, a, a big day for us as a delegation, us as a party, us as a movement, but this is a big day for activists all over the country and for frontline communities all over the country. Today is a big day for people who have been left behind. Today is a big day for workers in Appalachia. Today is a big day for children that have been breathing dirty air in the South Bronx. Today is a really good day for families who have been enduring the injustices of drinking dirty water or who have seen their living rooms being flooded in with the waves of flooded in with the, with the waves of uh, rising sea, sea levels. 
And today, I think, is a really big day for our economy, the labor movement, the social justice movement, indigenous peoples, and people all over the United States of America. Because today is the day that we truly embark on a comprehensive agenda of economic, social, and racial justice in the United States of America. That's what this agenda is all about. Because climate change, climate change and our environmental challenges are the, one of the biggest existential threats to our way of life. Not, at, not just as a nation, but as a world. And in order for us to combat that threat, we must be as ambitious and innovative in our solution as possible. So what we are doing today and in introducing these resolutions here today is that it's not a bill. It is a resolution. And what this resolution is, is doing is saying this is our first step. Our first step is to define the problem and define the scope of the solution. And so we're here to say that small incremental policy solutions are not enough. They can be part of a solution, but they are not the solution unto itself. There is no justice and there is no combating climate change without addressing what has happened to indigenous communities. That means that there is no fixing our economy without addressing the racial wealth gap. That means that we are not going to transition to renewable energies without also transitioning frontline communities and coal communities into economic opportunity as well. That is what this is about. It is comprehensive, it is thoughtful, it is compassionate, and it is extremely economically strategic as well. Today is also the day that we choose to assert ourselves as a global leader in transitioning to 100% renewable energy and charting that path. That means that we are not going to peg ourselves by the lowest, uh, by, by the lowest standards of other nations. It doesn't mean that we're going to say, what about them? They're not doing it. What about them? They're not doing it. Why should we? We should do it because we should lead. We should do it because that is what this nation is about. We should do it because we are a country founded on ideals of a culture that is innovative, that, that cares for our brothers and sisters across this country. We should do it because we are an example to the world. That is why we should do it. And we need to save ourselves and we can save the rest of the world with us. That is why we should do it. And that's why we define the scope of this resolution to be so broad and to be so comprehensive. Because we are, we are outlining the Green New Deal. And in the spirit of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we have the Green New Deal and we have Green New Deal projects. The Tennessee Valley Authority was a, green new, was a New Deal project that was part of a larger vision. And today we're laying down what that larger vision is. So when people say, what about this or what about that? The answer isn't, this is why we're, it's not in here. The answer is, that is part of the solution too. And so I hope you all see that. I hope you all see the scope and the scale because the solution is not gonna come from just one Congresswoman from the Bronx. It's not gonna come just from one senator. It's going to come from all of our representatives as a country saying this is what Iowa needs. This is what Virginia needs. This is what Michigan needs. This is what Illinois needs. And this is what New York needs. Because all, you know, when we have this threat that challenges all of us, the solution is gonna take all of us too. So I'm so thankful. I'm thankful again. I want to reiterate my thanks to the activists and advocacy and the organizers who made this moment happen and created the political energy to be relevant and to put it at the top of the agenda, not the bottom of the agenda. So thank you all very, very Excellent. much. Thank you, Alexandria. Now, I'd like uh, very briefly to introduce our two great senators from Oregon who are here today. I want to begin with an incredible climate champion, Jeff Merkley. Wow, I am so excited to be here with these two leaders from our two houses of Congress uh, working to build a whole coalition inside the House and inside the Senate to take this vision of a Green New Deal forward. This vision is born of two profound challenges that we face as a society. One of those is climate chaos. We see it in the forest fires of the Northwest. 
We see it of the more powerful hurricanes assaulting the southeast, and we see it in a dozens and dozens of other issues in between. We know the damage that's being done. We know the damage being done to agriculture, to our farmers in America. We know the damage being done to our forests and our forest timber communities. We know the damage being done to our fisheries. This is not an urban problem. This is not a rural problem. This is a problem hurting everybody. And that means it's not a red or blue issue. It's not a Republican or Democratic issue. It is all of us coming together in our responsibility as elected leaders to forge a vision to take on this issue, which is doing so much damage to our country and to our planet. And through our leadership, our example, our efforts, work in partnership with the world. The second massive issue of income inequality. For every decade since I came out of high school, the working wages have been flat or declining while the wealth of America increased. So many communities bypassed with different economic initiatives. Frontline communities, sometimes ignored, sometimes deliberately ignored, often not benefiting in tangible ways. We have to make sure that this is a movement that touches our frontline communities and our coal communities and our oil communities as we all work together for this prosperous future. So let's take these two issues together, create tens of millions of jobs, a huge, huge increase in economic and social equality. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, we're also joined by the top Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee, uh, the great Ron Wyden. Come on in, Ron. Thank you, Ed. And the three speakers have said it very well, and what is especially exciting about this morning is the opportunity for reform on several fronts. And I am here today to say, as the senior Democrat on the committee that writes tax policy in the Senate, the Senate Finance Committee, it's my intention to work with all of these good people to throw the dirty energy tax relics of yesteryear into the garbage can and work to put clean energy front and center for a healthier future for Americans from sea to shining sea. Beautiful. I thank all thank our lead sponsors. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, Go ahead. Okay, come on in. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm very, I'm very um, excited about the support. We'll see, you know, when we, you'll see when we introduce this legislation, we have a very large amount of co-sponsors in, in the Democratic caucus. We're at over 60 now, 60 co original co-sponsors in legislation, which is an enormous amount. And we even have more that weren't able to, to be original co-sponsors. So there are more that are co-sponsoring the legislation even after our initial rollout. I'm very excited. I see, and, and this includes broad support across the party. I'm very excited about it. And I'm really excited for our, our party's overall commitment to addressing this issue. No, I think it is a green dream. And I think that uh, it is, it is. And, and I think that, uh, that all great, all great, uh, all great American programs, everything from the great society to the New Deal started with a vision for our future. And I don't think that, um, you know, I don't consider that to be a dismissive term. I think it's a great term. <laughs> and, and there is no, there is no greater champion on climate change than Nancy Pelosi. That's right. I was the That's chair right. of the Select Committee on Energy uh, Independence and Global Warming. There's no greater In champion. The and at at uh, just at noontime today, she said she welcomes the enthusiasm of the backers of the Green New Deal. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we uh, have here. All issues go through three phases, political education, political activation, political mm -hmm. implementation. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the beginning of the education and activation phase, and ultimately we're going to have the legislative implementation phase mm -hmm. of this program as well. Mm -hmm. Is that where you stand on this? 
Uh, the, the resolution is silent on any individual technology uh, which can uh, move us towards a solution of this problem. This is a, uh, a resolution that does, that does not have individual prescriptions in it. Mm -hmm. So it is silent, the resolution itself. That is not part of the resolution. Are there any Republicans you're talking to, are there any Republicans you're talking to that have signaled any willingness to come aboard and can you name any names? I actually, I won't name names, not trying to get anyone in trouble here early, um, but I do think, <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that it, you know, when, when I do kind of speak to, to members of the Republican caucus, there are a few issues where they truly believe and, and express interest in coming together. And in addition to criminal justice reform and, and infrastructure, um, which this is in many ways an infrastructure bill as well, is the environment. And we are really starting to see that environmental and climate issues are issues that swing voters decide who they're going to cast their vote on. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm thrilled to say that there is interest. So, uh, do you want me? To uh, you go, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think, I, and I spoke about this this morning, is that I think that part of this is also really examining the role of government and, and what government is for. And I don't think that, um, I think it's important that we get away and we also study our economic history, that uh, government expenditure is not always just 100% offset by, uh, by a, a tangible increase in that tax that same year. And so, um, so I think that, that we've, we certainly saw that, that we, saw, we certainly see the Republican embrace of that with the tax cut bill, which, I, which does not generate economic growth. Um, but I, I, I'm looking forward to really communicating that this is an investment. You know, for every one dollar that we spend on infrastructure, we get a return on that investment. For every one dollar that we spend on tax cuts, we get less than a dollar back. And so this is about making smart investments, um, and this is about making investments that actually generate returns and not lying about the fact that they generate returns. They actually generate returns. And one thing we're going to fight for is to make sure that all the renewables, all electric vehicles, that they're getting the same tax rates that the fossil fuel industry has received. <laughs> For the last 100 years, that's a fight worth having, and they might consider that to be a tax increase, but that is something that we are going to try to remove from the tax rolls of our country. Question? Yeah. Yes, right here. So, I mean, about a decade ago, you and Tim Grove, you were leading a sweeping movement for cap and trade measure. Yes. Um, the difference between 2009 and 10 and today is the movement that has now been built, okay? We did not have that movement in 2009 and 10. This is now a voting issue across the country. The green generation has risen up, and they are saying that they want this issue solved. And they want the people who work in this building and occupy the White House to solve this problem. So this is going to enter the 2020 election cycle as the, one of the top two or three issues for every candidate on both sides for them to have to answer. And yes, that was the year the Koch brothers, that was the year Peabody Cole started to pour their millions into trying to create a climate where people did not believe in climate science. We now have the troops, we now have the money, we're ready to fight, okay? And so the difference between 2009 and 10 and today is we now have our army as well. Okay, you wanna? Yeah. Sure thing, sure thing. And I think it's important to, to, you know, just to reiterate on that as well, is that I think a lot of times when people say what, who lost elections on what, I often think they're wrong, <laughs> just personally. I don't think that we lose elections by addressing climate change. I don't think we ever have and I don't think we ever will. I think that uh, what, what this is really about is how ambitious we're going to be. And what I sense, at least in, in some portions of the country, is that 
people grow frustrated because they don't feel like we're being ambitious enough ambitious enough and people grow frustrated by half measures and solutions that don't comprehensively uh, and, and effectively touch their everyday lives. Um, and on, on the other half of the issue, I want to reiterate uh, what, what Senator Markey also said earlier, is that Nancy Pelosi is a leader on climate, has always been a leader on climate, and I will not allow our caucus to be divided up by silly notions of whatever narrative. We are in this together. We are 100 percent in this together. And that... It, and just as and we have different uh, solutions and different mechanisms, different cars we got to drive to get there. But we got to take a lot of a lot of different paths. We have the Environmental Subcommittee on Oversight. We have the entire Energy and Commerce Committee. We have the Judiciary Committee that also is going to play a role in, in so many of these tangential effects. And it's going to take all of us doing it together. And I think that's the really important uh, c uh, point to get across because this, uh, this issue faces all of us and we are not going to get divided over it, period. We leave no one behind on our solutions. And we have, by the way, and we have the chairman of the Rules Committee, Jim McGovern, with us, who decides which bills come to the floor of the United States House of Representatives, all right? You, you don't get more powerful than that. Well, I think it's, first of all, I find this hilarious because, because this president seeks to expand government into the bodies of women. They seek to expand government to spontaneously generate detention centers all along our southern border. They seek to expand government in separating children from their parents. They seek to expand government in passing massive increases in, in military spending when we have no wars to fight or that we should be fighting. So this is not about who's expanding government. It's about who we're working for. And we're choosing to work for the people of the United States. Beautiful. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, you talked about being 100 percent united. But today, Speaker Pelosi appointed a climate commission that you are not on. Mm -hmm. and, when, and, and in her remarks today, said she had not even read mm -hmm. the resolution. Mm -hmm. So how sure are you that she's behind this effort? I know. So uh, Speaker Pelosi and I have have spoken at length about climate. We share this priority. She she did, in fact, invite me to be on the committee. And so I don't think that this is a snub. I don't think that this is any, you know, anything like that. And we can have the conversation about the committee another day. But today is about the vision that we're putting forward and the actual legislative plan. And that is th right now. This legislative scope is the only legislative scope that has been presented in this Congress. As a follow-up, why did you decide not to serve on the committee? I think that, and again, I think I, I serve on the uh, Environmental Subcommittee of Oversight. I'm on four subcommittees. We're doing this. <laughs> and additionally, the, uh, the, the Select Committee is an investigatory body, and I'm really excited to support Representative Castor in her agenda in holding these hearings in frontline communities. Um, and we also have, so they're, they're tackling the investigative piece, and right now we're tackle, tackling the legislative piece. And just to go back, just to the waxman Markey bill in 2009, it could not have passed without Nancy Pelosi right. on the floor of the House of Representatives, right. and it reduced greenhouse gases by 80% by the year 2050. The reason we're here now is that our scientists are now saying to our president, that is federal government scientists are now saying to their own president in defiance of his views on climate science, that it's even more urgent that we act sooner. The UN scientists are saying the same thing. So there's no question that Nancy Pelosi was the champion and will continue to be the champion to put together the team on every legislative committee to produce the legislation to solve this problem. And by the way, we have three members of the select committee here right now with us. Beautiful. So right. give them a Beautiful. big round of applause. Beautiful. Beautiful. We've got energy and commerce here too. So. Excellent. Yes. Yes, sir. The more important. Democrats called Congress and the President's team in 2021 that don't have a filibuster proof 60 seats in the Senate. Should they limit the filibuster?
question. How does this legislation and black policy, what you call, the most serious problem for Vermont? Um, that would be a good problem to have. That would be an excellent uh, discussion that we will have to have. My own feeling is that this is going to be such a powerful issue in the 2020 election cycle that we're going to have the Republican support all across the country to pass it with 60 votes and a supermajority in the House as well. That's what this mobilization is all about. No, I believe that we're going to start in the House to look at all of the options that are available uh, to uh, deal with this um, issue. And I think we'll start to see bills that are developed. Over on the Senate side, you already heard Ron Wyden talk about Senate finance uh, in terms of the development of smart ways in which we can advance the renewable energy agenda in our country. So it begins now. Okay, There's a mobilization which has begun. There's a... The, the, Congress is a stimulus response institution. There's nothing more stimulating than tens of millions of people who are saying we want something done now. And they don't mean 2021, they mean right now. Yeah, right over here. Yeah, no, this is a this is an excellent question. I think uh, a lot of what we're trying to do is transition our nation's infrastructure because one of the reasons why low income communities do not have access to renewables is because of what our default is. Our default is fossil fuels. And so what this is what we're trying to do is make sure and transition our national default to renewables and clean energy. And so when our default is renewable, when our default investments are clean, then then all of us by default, regardless of income, will have access to to those energy sources. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Um, and again, I, I, a lot of this goes into the actual structure of what we're doing. We're laying forth the resolution, and, uh, and the resolution outlines the scope of the bills that will kind of be considered Green New Deal projects or bills. And so I think that, that taking that approach can strategically really bring us together. One of those things that I'm really looking forward is figuring out how we fully fund coal miners' pensions because it is that economic fear that is that is kind of preventing us from transitioning. So we do and we we are placing the the workers in those communities, not the fossil fuel corporations, but the interests of the workers first. And I and I know and I know that we all have a commitment to making sure that we are not putting one type of energy forward at the expense of a community's way of life. And so I look forward to cleaning the water in West Virginia. I look forward to working with grassroots activists uh, in making sure that we are protecting the environment in West Virginia and making sure that all of those pensions get fully funded, their wages get higher, and that they have a sustained way of life. And again, while the resolution does not mention any specific technology, uh, it talks about any technology that can dramatically reduce greenhouse gases. So while it doesn't mention carbon capture and sequestration, uh, we are open to whatever works. Uh, and we're going to leave it to the committees in the Congress to devise the smartest ways in which those technologies are incentivized. Uh, well, it's pretty clear that in 2010, uh, the Waxman-Markey bill died uh, on the Senate floor, uh, and it never really came to a vote. So without question, there's a lot of energy um, that is in the House of Representatives, but I am very confident um, that this movement is going to grow so large and so powerful that we're going to find Republican senators who are going to walk, want to work across the aisle to produce solutions. And if not, it's going to become a voting issue in the 2020 election cycle. Okay, last question. Yes, sir. Again, the, the resolution deals with principles. We don't deal with any individual um, uh, approach that would be taken. Uh, that's for the debate now to uh, <laughs> open up wide so we can find the smartest ways of going. 
but to make sure that any taxes are also fair to poor people in our society as well. A lot of times that was never a consideration, that the poor is paid the most. So we're very concerned about that, but it doesn't mention any one of those specific approaches in the legislation. Thank you all so much Thank for being you. here. Thank you. My fellow young, my fellow young lucky <laughs> members. I think when we're working on the resolution, there are times when you're staff. Okay, good. Okay, great job. Okay. Done.